Never leave your career in the hands of your employer. You have accountability for your career. You have the power to make it happen. It may not be easy, but we have such access to opportunities now, more than ever, we should no longer expect somebody else to put us on a training programme or notice it at our mid-year review. Hello and welcome to Becoming the Influential Me, the Mentors Edition. Thank you again for tuning in. Today I am speaking to a woman who is a force of nature. Her name is Adrienne Kelby. And there are some women on this planet that make me love doing my job. And Adrienne is definitely one of those women. She started out as a temp. And she's somebody who knew her own mind enough to say, I'm not going to university. I'm just going to see how this path goes. So without a degree, as a temp, and she worked her way up into, into becoming the CEO of the nuclear regulator in the United Kingdom, which is unimaginable for a lot of us. But Adrienne talks us through it in this podcast and how you can do it too. She talks about, um, you know, together in this podcast, we discussed how sometimes you don't need to be so good at what you do that you make yourself indispensable, you know, and that can be the key to moving you forward. We talked about passion and that not being enough, but when you couple it with resilience and tenacity and a few other bits, you can really go far in your career. We also talked about knowing when to move, you know, knowing when to go and knowing when to stay and how that can really shape your career for the better if you understand that you are not a tree and that you need to move. And and, and sometimes it's not easy, but you need to make the move. Um, because you know what? She talks about how your comfort zone is not your friend. We also talked about trusting in your ability to learn and how sometimes that's more important than knowing. It's more important than, you know, having a system down packed, trusting your ability to learn. We talked about so much in this podcast, and I think you are going to absolutely love it because the knowledge and the wisdom that this woman shares with such ease, actually, she's a joy to listen to, um, will blow your mind. So I won't talk anymore. Have a listen to this podcast and I can't wait to hear what you think of it. Thank you, Adrian, so much for joining us. I'm really, really looking forward to our chat today. Um, it's just obviously following up on the chat that we've had previously. So um, I know a little bit more than other people do. Um, you have the inside track, right? I'm... And you still came back. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, and start to ask. So when people hear, oh, you know, she's on this board, she was a CEO of the nuclear of a nuclear regulator and all this, people think genius, smarty pants, top of the class. So I just want to start straight in and ask you, tell us a little bit about your schooling experience. Well, the good news is I wasn't genius and, and definitely not smarty pants, um, but I really did work hard. So my parents moved a uh, house a few times, so that meant I moved school. And, um, you know, I, I enjoyed my schoolwork on the whole. I liked being diligent. I, I, you know, I was one of these kids that did their homework and didn't speak back and always listened and sometimes put my hand up. Um, but I definitely wasn't the brightest in, in any of the classes at all. But, you know, I, I would work hard. So, you know, for me, the, the, the thing that my mum and dad always emphasised for me was to work hard and do my best. You know, my, my wonderful late father would say, just do your best, Dolly. Um, and if best meant being first in the class for something, uh, it would work in technical drawing, for example, I was really good at. Or maybe not quite so, so top of the class like math, then that was OK, so long as I was doing my best. And I think that was a really um, a good uh, lesson early on, because frankly, none of us can be the best at everything. We just have to find one of the things that we can do well at through working hard. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's, so so you, you, this idea of always doing your best um, and this idea that it doesn't matter if you came first, um, what were the things that you were good at? Did you really thrive in science, technology and all of these other subjects that we assume you did? Uh, no. <laughs> 
So I, 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 my first secondary school didn't require you to take a science. So I didn't. Um, I, I took um, languages. I took German uh, and French and I took um, metalwork and um, technical drawing. I think we were forced to do gym because I certainly wouldn't have volunteered for that with those horrible hard socks and hideous outfits and, and out in the cold as it was in Scotland very often in the winter. I wouldn't have volunteered for that. But actually, um, I was quite good at shot putt for example. How does that come out of my head today? So I was this little tiny, you know, light thing. And, and yeah, I was quite good at throwing a, a small heavy ball quite far. Um, don't ask me how, I do not know. Um, so I was quite good at shot part and absolutely no applicable use today whatsoever. Uh, and I was good at English. I, I really enjoyed English. So that that permeated all of my schools. But when I changed, I changed from a school which didn't require science to requiring science. So in all fairness, I don't think I, I gave it a fair shot. I had to crash chemistry halfway through, um, just about towards the final year. Um, and I got put in remedial class because what do you do with somebody who doesn't know anything joining a class near the end? So they put me in remedial class, which maybe wasn't the optimum learning environment for somebody who likes to work hard. So so my chemistry, I scraped with a C, thanks mainly to the wonderful teacher, Adrienne. It was the first other Adrienne Gribben, if I recall her name. Um, but no discernible talent in that really. You know, my thing was English. I enjoyed learning for its own sake, uh, very much. And yeah, shot pup. <laughs> Who knew? I did begin to get into horses though. Um, outside of school, I, I bored my mum rigid and my dad for years to to let me go on a pony. So at a young age, I got shot on a donkey in Spain, um, as you do. And I, I didn't like being led about too much. So I find that a bit embarrassing. But um, I, I got sent off to riding school lessons every sort of Thursday night and Saturday morning. In again, in the cold and the wet, <laughs> it requires some stamina. Um, and I got better at that over time. But even at that, I, I didn't start, I wouldn't say gifted on any level. I just worked really hard and spent as much time as I could with the ponies because I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to the horses. Um, but before I do that, tell me, tell us a little bit about, you know, your home life growing up. You moved a lot. Um, and, and, you know, tell us a little bit about your mum and dad and that dynamic. So I've been very blessed, um, you know, to have a, a, a mum and dad in a stable relationship who loved me enormously, despite all of my failings. Um my mum was an estate agent and a receptionist. She she did kind of administrative related work. But actually, um, when she became pregnant with me, she was ICI's first ever female supervisor. Just remembered that. And in those days, she had to step down uh, when she became pregnant. And um, she looked after me for a few years before going back to work. Um, my dad was a mechanical engineer who was very gifted at fixing things, but also loved languages. He used to try and learn a language every time we went on holiday. He did quite well at Spanish and German, but Greek basically caught him out big time. <laughs> but um, but you know, I was I was fortunate, and and I realised the more I get older, the impact that that those early years really have. So, although my world felt quite unstable in some ways, I didn't enjoy moving schools and not really having a clique and I, I didn't sometimes feel I fitted in terribly well. Um, they were always there and always made sure I was okay. Mm. Uh, my mum actually became unwell in, in early years for me. We, you know, we went on holiday and overnight she, she developed a virus that uh, brought her back in a wheelchair. So, you know, I went from having probably a more standard to healthy, able-bodied parents to my mum being very unwell for, uh, you know, well over a decade, a very long time. And I think, again, realising now how much they try to shelter me from that, um, but still, as an only child in a house, one notices uh, when things are not great. And, you know, my dad really um, did an amazing job of looking after me, you know, making sure that he took me everywhere that I needed to be and, and, and kept up the school and really looking after my mum. Um, for, for that as well as holding down a, a you know a challenging shift job so um, only child great parents uh, some interesting differences perhaps from other folks in terms of you know our, our journey um, but definitely very fortunate to have two sensible parents to talk to I mean, I don't know the, sorry 
it, so it, it sounds to me like you know just doing a quick summary of your childhood you um are not a a genius but you were extremely hard working you had parents that were pushing you effectively to say you know what we don't want you to be perfect at, at everything we just want you to do your best you have a mum who is right who has a career who has her own way and then she's struck by this disability and that in to to, to my mind means that you then grow up with this because a lot of us grew up with a mother who does everything in the home and then the father goes out to work but for you the roles suddenly kind of blur and merge into one because your mum has a disability your dad has to do a lot of the heavy lifting both in the home and out so you're blessed enough to have you know no fixed set ideas of what gender roles should be from a very young age um and then uh tell us a little bit more about this other passion that you had you mentioned it earlier about your horses and and um how that came into play because you, school wasn't it for you let's face it I mean it, it it didn't it wasn't your happy place it wasn't the place where you were successful in quotes um but what was yeah I mean you know at school I did well I got good grades it just you know it, it was functional in in some ways but oh put my little arms around the neck of a pony or my, my my little face squashed up against a horsey nose. And that is a happy place. Now, I'm an animal person. You know, I always have been. A, I still talk to street dogs in the street when I probably shouldn't. But for me, um, just being around them uh, made me happy. And um, I, I started, my mum got me into it actually because she used to ride horses. And, and the reason they kind of gave in was that she wanted somebody to go horse riding with her in the lesson. Um, so I actually started with my mum and um, and then it kind of fell away and it was me and and early, big lesson for me earlier on, a, a horse ran away with me, essentially it bolted and it was very scary, uh, I'm only a little thing and um, my mum was on that lesson with me, she was furious with the instructors that she'd let it happen, but um, I stopped, I stopped going altogether and yet I was still badgering my parents about how I really, really wanted to be around the horses and um I think that was probably the first dose of tough love I got you know my dad essentially said to me put up or shut up either go back and ride or be quiet mm -hmm. so obviously when faced with this at a young age I had to make a decision and um I was more afraid of disappointing my father than anything so I went back um, and it was a real lesson that you know resilience and adversity come as a package um and you know I think about age 12, they finally got me a little hairy lone pony. But that for me was somewhere where I could see myself getting better. Um, he then encouraged me to go into competition. It hadn't been what I thought I'd do. And um, I was absolutely appalling. I didn't even go over the first fence. I was burning with shame. My cheeks were flame red at the shame of three refusals <laughs> at the first fence. It's not actually possible to do any better. To, to do any worse, you know, if you get in the ring, you can't do any worse than that. So here I was again, faced with this um, <laughs> put up or shut up <laughs> many tears later, and probably the occasional lying face down on bed hour or two whilst I pondered my, um, my future, you know, I, I did literally get back on the horse. Yeah. Um, and over the years, I became um, relatively successful you know I, I jumped for 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 um you know one of the scottish pony club teams i won cross country and show jumping competitions and and again i, I worked really hard at that because it is simply not possible to have another living being dependent on you mm -hmm. um and do well if you don't feed care do all the unpleasant stuff and keep a schedule so it really taught me i think resilience discipline and passion kind of need to come together Passion without the discipline and without the ability to take setbacks is nothing. It doesn't change your future. But if you can package them together, I think it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I love that. I think um, as we go through your story, we'll understand how this passion of yours and the lessons you learned from fusing your passion into your life actually had a, a really big impact more so than in, in my mind anyways more so than academics more so than oh, 100 percent um, more so than 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 luck than the right opportunities coming across but actually the mindset that that skill of mucking out every morning and you know clearing up the horses and knowing that you know what you either as your father said 
you know, do what you need to do or just be quiet. This idea that, you know, you've got to be focused on your goals. If you fail, get back on the horse, literally. <laughs> and um, and just keep moving. So so tell us a little bit more about, um, sorry, I've got to cut this bit. Could you do me a favor? We're, like, don't uh, touch your mic and just stare at it because I can hear you perfectly. Um, yeah, super. Okay, I'll be back in. So, I mean, as I mentioned before, when people hear about your story, they sort they assume that you are this uh, science genius, science guru. So, tell us actually, you know, you you so you you you're doing well enough at school. You've got your horses. How did you make that transition into into career? Very quickly, as it turned out, I um I didn't want to go to university. Uh, my grades were good enough. I just didn't want to spend four or five years of my life doing one thing. Uh, so I went to college, and and even at that, I, th- I think I compromised with my parents on a, a HND, a two year college program. But it, I, I was it wasn't quick enough for me. I was bored, um, not in a destructive way. I would never be disrespectful to you know other people in a class, but it didn't hold my interest. Um, so, so I applied for a job that I saw in the newspaper because that's how you saw jobs then. And um, over a, a you know just a few days, I, I explained to to my parents that I was not going to take the fabulous paid work placement that I'd found, ironically in ICI where my mum had previously been supervisor. Um, I was going to stop college altogether, not do the second year. And um, go off to do this job, which happened to be um, several hundred miles away uh, in a living position. So there was a lot going on there for my parents <laughs> to absorb. Uh, now I'm looking at it thinking, you did what? Uh, you know, and, and to be clear, I am not suggesting anybody else should do this. Um, but, you know, the, the context for me was probably one of deep naivety. Um, however, it, it, it was amazing. Um, and I, I just got stuck in and those things I didn't know how to do, but I didn't mind, you know, it wasn't Google, but I could learn. And um, I, I, I loved that job. That was the beginning of me beginning to be a temp, um, you know, I, 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 that one was uh, helpfully as a PA, but also looking after an individual's um, resources. So yeah. I'm very clear that I probably, got the, I probably got the job more because of the resources than I did the PA, but I did a bloody good job at both. <laughs> and this this whole sense of what can I do and how do I learn the things I don't just felt, you know, common sense to me. Um, I attempt for a few years in, in different jobs, uh, like digital, a big computing company in the day, um, some smaller companies, Brit Oil, uh, before it was BP. And in all of them, again, I was kind of, I suppose I was treating it like paid learning experiences as much as anything else interesting so so you chose to learn on the job rather than go the conventional route which is if you want to be anything near successful go to university um in a nutshell um, but i want to go back to that point though how did you because sometimes we do want to take up when when we're in a career or when we are just about to embark on a career wherever you are go back into a career um you know we sometimes are tempted to make unconventional choices like the ones that you made how at such a young age how old were you 18 yes yeah so at 18 how did you how did you have the wherewithal to sort of say okay there's this job I found in a newspaper my parents think I should do this go to college probably society expects me to go down this university route but I don't want to do that I want to do this uh, talk us through the kind of, I don't know, the rationale, the strength where you get the gumption, the conviction, whatever it takes to make that kind of call. I am, um, I've always been quite an independent person uh, and it was a bone of contention through my childhood. You know, I'm sure that was quite difficult on on, so, on some levels for my parents to, to cope with. You know, I, I had an opinion on, on life. Um, and to be honest, I don't think at the time I considered it in that way. It just seemed like something that was more interesting and more suited. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hasn't always been confident steps. You know, there have been times in, in my career where I've been, you know, I find it really difficult to make decisions um, about what to do next and being given opportunities that make me afraid. As you know, I, I, it's great. I've been offered it. <gasps> I don't know if I can do it. Um, and I think 
that's natural for a lot of people. But there is there is something about a self belief in our ability to learn in our ability to, to tackle new situations, but also in our ability to leave if it doesn't work. And, you know, I suppose my mindset would be if I don't like it or if I am incapable of learning it or if I'm not doing a good job in service to others, then I will leave mm -hmm. and I will do something else. And, you know, maybe, you know, I sort of think as humans, we imagine we're trees sometimes. You know, when I do this, I am now rooted to it. We're not. We have a choice. So I guess I was just practicing earlier my um, my choice exercising. <laughs> I, I love that because I also, when I was 18 or 19, made some decisions that I look back on now and think, oh gosh, I wish I had the same courage I had. But at the time it was completely clear and normal. So I do definitely concur that we aren't trees and we do have and should have the, the, the self-belief. And, and the trust in ourselves that sometimes you really know what's right for you before you take in other people's perspectives. But as you say, listen to your parents, folks. <laughs> yes, be, do safe things. I wouldn't recommend, you know, heading off to have a live-in position when you haven't done some due diligence, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, yeah. But, you know, if, if you're not going to practice and try things out early in your career, then, then where are you? Correct. I completely agree with you. So speaking of early careers, you started out as a temp and as you mentioned you were temping around in, in lots of different in, in, and you, you did temp work in lots of different industries um and then you made a transition into training tell us a little bit about how that came about well what I noticed that very much you know being an, an agency temp is that you sort of were treated like wallpaper um by some you know, kind of in the background, not really noticeable, just do the grunt work. Um, and yet other people engaged far more. But I was always I was always listening and watching how stuff really got done. I find that fascinating. So I'm I'm working on the job, doing the thing I'm paid for, but I'm also noticing the environment and, and I find that really interesting. And I, I was sent to um an assignment as a an office manager. Um somebody gone sick, I think. And the um, organization was one which ran a uh, training for adults. And that trainer had also um, left, uh, I think, quite quickly. So I, I kind of wandered in and I just asked if I could help. Um, one of the classes was admin, and I knew a bit about that, obviously, because I had my one year at college and my work experience. Uh, and the other was electronics, which I knew a lot less about, but I could wire a plug. So um, I just kind of asked if I could help. And the manager of the the operation came to speak to me and said, would you like to apply for the training job? And I was really blown away because all I was doing was trying to be helpful. I had no formal background, you know. I mean, I, I sort of made what I now might think was a mini lesson plan because I cribbed off the syllabus and tried to make it real. But um, I said I would apply and I did. And that I will take the job only if you give me proper training so I'd like to do my NVQ units as it was in training and then I also did train the trainer because I find that interesting as well so I helped other trainers uh, and through that um, you know again secondment somebody else hired me through that city and guilds also put me through my external verification so I ended up going out to lots of providers in my slightly spare time helping them set up similar programs well so it, it really um, just rolled from um, an absence, stepping into it, being offered a job and, and beginning to develop a skill set there. And I really loved being a trainer. Um, I loved working with people and seeing them come on and the look on people's faces when they achieve something that maybe they'd been told all their lives they couldn't do. That that was a big deal because I worked in quite impoverished areas um, where Nobody had anything like the chances I'd had coming up. So a very sobering experience as well. What I find interesting about that, and I think I mentioned this to you in our last conversation, is that you didn't apply for, you didn't sit at home and apply for 15 trainer jobs. You probably hadn't even thought about trainer, but what you did do is you made space for yourself. They did, you made it such that that person that asked you if you'd like to apply saw, hang on a minute, there is an Adrienne uh, shaped 
hole in our business. Um, right, because suddenly she's doing a lot of stuff. And if she leaves after this temp job is finished, there's going to be a gap. And, and and so sometimes I think we think the only way we can get ahead is to tr apply for a job, have a conversation with your manager about what 10 steps you need to get to, you know, the next ladder rung. But actually, sometimes it's just as simple as doing what needs to be done, helping out. You didn't know if you were going to like the training job or not. You just thought, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and you loved it. So yeah. I, I just I think that is such a, a powerful thing that sometimes we don't do often enough. Just help out. Just try it. If you want to be a project manager, just ask if there's a few things you can project manage whilst you're still doing your job as well. So I, I think that that's really um, powerful. And I think that's really driven by your keenness to learn, your curiosity. Um, so after a few years in this role, there was another pivotal point in your career um, where you inadvertently created opportunities for yourself. So tell us a little bit more about this experience. Well, I was around... Um... In still working in sort of training projects when the community fund was established back in 95. And that was to distribute the brand new then National Lottery Funds to charitable good causes. And there wasn't an infrastructure body already in the UK for that. So they set one up and um, I applied and I didn't get the money. This was for a project that I was I was the manager of. And um, I was gutted because the money would have really gone a long way for some of the aspirations we had in that area. Um, <laughs> so, I, now I don't know if you call this making opportunities, but I heckled the person in charge in public. Um, I went to, uh, they were doing a lot of out outreach events and I went to one and it happened to be the director who was presenting at that stage, essentially telling people how to get this money. And, um, I, I put my hand up and I asked about feedback to unsuccessful applicants. Uh, John Rafferty was the, the man's name. And it, it kind of it kind of avoided my question. <laughs> so I continued to stand up and I put my hand up again. And, and this is in a kind of, um, it's in the old Scottish Parliament building. So it's very, very visible. It's, it's kind of like a gladiatorial. Uh, you know, if you can imagine, you know, he's, he's down in the, down in the sandpit we're all around the edges and I said again I'm so sorry perhaps I didn't make my question clear um you know what is your reason for not giving feedback and of course the reason was that we're too busy so I took issue with that <laughs> basically I took issue with that and um somebody posted me the job advert I still don't know who it was but you know this envelope came into me um with the, the job advert cut because I wasn't looking for a job I was really happy doing what I was doing for the operations manager in the Scotland office, reporting directly to the gentleman I had heckled in in public. Um, <laughs> that's why I applied anyway, and I got it. Because uh, it was all about um, assessment, systems, processes, consistency. All the stuff I've been doing through my training career that could be directly applied to grant making. So um, so I started the job and, and on day one, I, I sort of, you know, I go in as you do a bit, bit nervous about these things. And, um, in, you know, basically my first morning I went and I, and I found my file, you know, the file that I'd made the, the grant application for. And I pulled out these huge, huge um, filing. Uh, there was thousands of these things. I pulled mine out and, and have a look at it. And, um, and there's the feedback. I said, you know, basically good application, but too many of them in a, in, a, in a similar area. There wasn't really anything that I did wrong in my old job. It just it was just massively competitive, hugely competitive. So I, I did. I'll be honest. I did phone my old organisation and tell them that, which was probably a bit naughty. But um, but I kind of I had an early conversation with John saying this is wrong. We are spending public money on grant making, but as part of that. We should consider feedback a development opportunity, not on top of the work, but as part of the work. We should help community groups with at least limited feedback. Um, and we did. We were the first major funder to implement feedback um, in Europe. Uh, it's now, you know, transparency is a buzzword, isn't it, in, in most industries now, but, but back then it wasn't. So, so I'm not, again, I want to be really clear. I am not suggesting to anyone listening that a good strategy is to heckle <laughs> a powerful man with millions of grants uh, grants in his pocket who may or may not become your future employer. 
right? I'm, I'm not saying that it's a strategy for everybody. <laughs> strategy. Um, However, um, I think a lot of John, I mean, I was at his 70th birthday party in Spain, so we, we still talk um, on that. He forgave my perhaps uh, naivety about how to do it. But what I really respected about him is he was willing to help me take that agenda on um, within the organization as a whole and within a sector as a whole. And I don't think many people get that opportunity at 25. Absolutely. But what I think is, as you said, at that point, you're 25 years old. And I think what whoever whoever gave you that mystery envelope with the job cutting. thought, <laughs> yeah, Who are you? Are you out there? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that this woman can advance this organization because you showed that you didn't say, oh, I wrote it so perfectly. Why didn't you respond to my you didn't you didn't personalize it. What you said was as an organization, here is an area of improvement for you. I'm thinking about how to make progress in your organization. And it, it may not seem like that, you know, it may, may not have been your intention, but that's definitely how it came across to the person who gave you that envelope. And I think sometimes in our careers, we don't do that enough. We don't Think about the organization and ways to make not only the organization you were working for better, but also another organization better. Yeah, the whole sector, you know, because who doesn't want feedback? Who can who can improve in the dark? We all need somebody to give us something that shines a light on, on weaknesses or blind spots, or in this case, just bad luck. Yeah, but you spoke out and you spoke out in favor of progressing the organization. And for that, you were rewarded. And I think... That's the bigger lesson. The, maybe the, the way it was done, <laughs> that's questionable and not necessarily replicable. But the idea is, you know, whenever you're in a room with different people, show that you're able to think at that organizational level on ways to advance things, even though you were only 25. And I think yeah. that is, that is a, a really, really great, um, great gift. Um, the, the the next thing I want to ask, I mean, you since, since then you had a, a number of varied roles, a community fund, the big lottery fund, accounts commission for Scotland, you were CEO of the DBS and, and then your career in nuclear and now you're on boards. We can't keep up. So, um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, stepping into this idea of career change. Tell us a little bit about you know, how some of these jobs, some, some of these moves came about, you know, was it strategy? Was it luck? Um, were things handed to you? Or did you have to fight for things? Tell us a little bit about, about that journey, that change journey. It's funny, when, when I hear you describe it, I imagine a 70 year old woman somewhere. Um, uh, and honestly, I'm, I'm only in my early 50s. But, <laughs> you know, how, how did it come about? I think, again, it was back to this appetite of being useful, and being of service and actually really enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I've been very fortunate that my roles have, have, have allowed me to indulge those things, not always in the same measure. But, you know, what was common um, when I was in my funding roles, um, we as an organization merged twice, we took on new duties under, under government's direction. There was a lot of change, uh, you know, project teams, corpus A, becoming a, a director uh, in my 20s, learning from others. So there was lots there that kept me occupied. And I thought when I went there, I might maybe do two or three years. <laughs> um, but within two or three years, I was the director um, because John had left. Within another few years, I was the deputy chief executive. So I had changed within that mantra um, but I did realize at one point that I was really sitting in my comfort zone. It came to me very starkly in a moment and I, and I recognized it. And I decided to act on that very quickly. I was just approaching my 40th birthday at the time. So my fear was that as soon as I stepped out of this beautiful environment, um, I would sink, mm. really just sink. And, and I find it difficult to get a reality check because I worked with extraordinary people and I, I really had a fear that when I stepped out, I'd be rubbish. So I thought, right, feel fast, try something hard. So job I've never done, sector I've never worked in, place I've never been, don't know. Um, so I applied for a job uh, that met those criteria <laughs> uh, at the development centre. There were 40 of us for three jobs at this development centre. And again, I thought, well, free feedback, 
I've been in one environment for a while. I'm probably not going to get the job, but it's free feedback. It's two days of developmental assessments and so on. I'll go for that. And um, I actually did get offered the job. So I took it and that was probably about the, the emotionally toughest job I've ever done because it was in a climate of really hard, hard hitting cuts to, to local government. Probably picked the worst year you could have gone into local government ever, especially as a senior officer. Um, and the my next move um, was to the Disclosure and Barring Service, which was a merger of the old Criminal Records Bureau and, and the Independent Safeguarding Authority, two very different organisations. My gran by this time had been in, in um, the care sector and I had some personal views about how that was run. Um, and I just thought that looked like a great job. So again, tried something different, moved to city again. Uh, tried something different, loved it, and we we made a good job of that. We modernised that, and you know, criminal record checks now come or DBS checks now come much more quickly than they used to for people, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, really enjoyed that. I got a call one day. Um, would you know MD that might be able to run the nuclear regulator? And I said no, <laughs> no, sorry. I put the phone down more or less politely. But somebody had to call me back to say, you know, we were wondering if you might apply. This is from the from the, the you know the agency retained for it. And um again, you know, that little voice going, No, 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 don't be ridiculous. Mm. You don't know anything about that. But when I spoke to them, they didn't need a nuclear person. We already had lots of them who were brilliant at it. What we needed was somebody who was more generic in leadership. And what I'd been picking up this whole time, Michelle, was transferable stuff. When you move from one place to the other, what do you bring with you? What do you need to learn? So my toolkit was not fully formed, of course, but I had a lot of stuff in it now that I've been gathering over all these years. So, you know, the big thing for me was when I made a move, make it a big move, make it worth the stress and the worry and the self-doubt um, because the opportunity is big. Oh, I absolutely love that. Um, I think you are so right. because I, I think boxed in thinking, like I said to you, I definitely thought CEO, nuclear regulator must mean I. you have to know everything about nuclear that exists, right? Automatically, it's like, and, and you probably, if you had seen that on paper, questionably, you probably wouldn't have applied for it because you would have thought, well, there's no way I can do that. Um, yeah, and, and this sense of recognising I give great credit to the chairman, Nick Baldwin, at that time, you know, recognising what the organisation needed. And, you know, I've never been very, I've not been hierarchical at all. I, I don't care what people's job titles are. I'm no more deferential to one than the other. Um, again, just part of my upbringing, I guess. But, you know, it's absolutely fine to recognise different skills are required. In fact, it's essential to recognise different skills. I think a challenge some companies have today is trying to put all these skills in one role in one person, which sets people up to fail. And therefore, you know, recognizing what's needed at certain points in organizations' journey is great. And for me, I, I mean, I, I understand the fundamentals of nuclear, you know, clearly, and, and a lot about regulation. But what I understand more than that are the dynamics of organizations, uh, stakeholder uh, strategies, or, you know, business strategy and and above all people and I, you know i think they're good things to have in a chief exec so uh, i was lucky i got to test them out and prove that theory yeah absolutely but i i also like the fact that you have two things in your back pocket all the time your ability to learn which you i i from what you've said have a lot of confidence in you know that's your greatest asset the the thing that you know you know you don't have to have all the knowledge but you know that you can learn whatever it is that you want to learn um number one and number two having an experimental approach mm. you know this idea that you, you went to this assessment center where you thought oh they're not gonna give me the job but it's great feedback <laughs> You know, it's like, um, but but this is what I often talk about people doing. Don't take things personally, right? Go into it with a mindset of, well, I'll learn something. You know, when you're making this big career change, somebody invites you to an interview, go. But don't pin all your hopes on it. And if it doesn't work, my life, my career is over and I'm no good. But rather, it'll be fun. I'm going to learn yeah. something. I'm going to get some feedback. And you know what? I'm going to take that feedback and move on to the next part. I'm going to fail fast. 
you know, I'm going to do what I need to do quickly. And I think that's the mindset that a lot of us um, talk ourselves out of. It's probably the best way to put that. We talk ourselves out of that inner voice that says, just go with it. And then we layer it on with loads of reasons why it can't be. Oh, we're, 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 I mean, human beings are amazing at, you know, um, being self-critical, you know, that kind of Teflon for praise and Velcro for uh, for criticism big time. But I, I do, you know, I, I believe that all of us have the ability to learn. We don't all have the will. And there are times when we have the, the resilience of the energy to do that. I'm not suggesting one is at this all the time, but. You know, I did think I was done. And then I stupidly decided to start doing some extra assessments a few years ago. And before I realized that I'd, I'd done, I think, four or five accreditations and, and some new tools. And at the moment, <laughs> at the moment, I'm doing some further accreditation. What's wrong with me? So, um, yeah, I'm just thinking about that. Every time I think I'm done, something else comes up and I think, oh, that'd be really interesting. I think I'll, I think I'll learn about that. You know, my, my nose is always in a book or a, a podcast. So it's lovely to share that. But these are resources that are available to everybody. You know, again, I'm very mindful not everybody has the blessings that I've had, but every one of us can access learning on Google instead of Candy Crush or, you know, choose how we spend a half an hour between meetings or on a train. And, you know, I, I think it's too easy now to fritter time away without recognizing the gift that it really is to us. Absolutely. I mean, you can't really emphasize that that much because there are a few things that are truly yours and your time is one of them and how you choose to to, to spend it. I, I do want to ask you, you know, in all these transition, you made a step change, in all these transitions, you made a step change from being in operational roles to being in strategic roles. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, is really challenging for a lot of women is making that step change from being a really good doer to being a really good thinker. Yeah. Um, and because we want to, it's easy when you do a task to say, look at the work that I did. Isn't it shiny, new, beautiful, and you get a pat on the back? But with strategic. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. But we have it ourselves. That's kind of our reassurance. Well, at least I know I did a good job, right? But when you're doing st strategic work and, and you tr you're trying to make that, that, that shift, it's challenging. It's challenging to say, because a lot of people come to me and they say, Michelle, I'm not getting promoted. I do such a good job. I basically live and breathe the work that I do, but I'm not being given the strategic opportunities. And it's because it's a different skill set. It's a different uh, mindset. Just, just help us understand how you managed to make that move, make that leap from doing, and I'm not saying uh, strategic strategic roles don't require doing because they do, um, but this, this this move from operational to strategic. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's a it's a kind of ailment that a lot of people come, you know, clearly in, in coaching as we are. I think the challenge is it, it's not about acquiring something new. It's about giving up something which gives us comfort. I think that's the bigger emotional challenge. And, you know, my, I have this little saying, your comfort zone is not your friend. And I say that because the things at which we are excellent and find comfort in are the very things that will kill us slowly. Uh, you know, that comfort blanket becomes heavier the longer you sit under it and it becomes harder and harder to look outside into the light. So how do you do it? I think the first thing you have to decide is what you're not going to do in order to create the space for it. You know, that kind of systems thinking, that consideration of a new environment, you know, a, a more of a leadership, more of a strategy environment requires a lot more thinking about the outside world and about how each of the elements across and out of the organization interrelate. So if you imagine looking at a, at a beautiful um, landscape painting, if what you're brewing at is describing the detail in the middle of that painting, um, you will be deeply correct about what you see. But it's only when you stand back, you might notice that there are ships in the harbour outside of the hill that you were <laughs> describing. And you won't be able to tell me how blades of grass there are, but I don't need you to do that anymore. I need you to notice something is coming around the corner at us. And I think the ability to stand back requires us to give up the identity of we are all-knowing, all-seeing fixers. Mm -hmm. And my best advice, if you are currently indis indispensable, stop it. 
because if you're indispensable there, you cannot, you cannot have other people thinking about where they're going to move you, let alone yourself. So stop being indispensable. Yes, I think that's such good advice. That's such good advice because people will think there's a Michelle-shaped hole in this organisation. We need to keep her there because she's brilliant. She's all kinds of great at that. Don't move her. It's a big headache. <laughs> exactly, because if you move her and then you put somebody else in and then she goes there and she doesn't do so well, then you have two headaches. Um, so, <laughs> so just don't go there. So I think that's really, really valuable um, advice. Um, and I, I spoke about how this is largely targeted at, at, at women. Um, so my next question to you is, how do you feel that being a woman has impacted your career? Has it impacted your career? I think it's impossible to say um, because we'd, we'd almost need all those sort of sliding doors moments to see what would have happened if we weren't something. But what I can say is this, um, show jumping, you know, my, my first passion before I got a real job. Uh, I didn't even notice that there isn't a, it's one of the few sports where men and women compete equally in the same class at the same age. Uh, I just hadn't thought about that. And it wasn't until the last seven or eight years that somebody pointed that out to me. Um, you know, gender roles. I've been in, in sectors where it's primarily women, fundraising, for example, and primarily men. Uh, nuclear, for example, I don't recommend either as an optimum operating environment because what I believe is in inclusion um, and diversity of thinking and background. So has it made a difference? Well, I guess it must have. You know, I think it's not possible for an inherent part of your identity to affect. Has it had a negative impact? Never knowingly, but then I wouldn't know I know when people have discounted me when they've walked into the room and assumed that because I was young, um, I was very junior. I have made the tea in more senior meetings than most people I know because people assumed that was my job. And then I've sat down and chaired the meeting. That would not be the first thing. I found it funny. I didn't take it personally. People didn't do it again. So, you know, I actually think probably we're constantly making subconscious judgments about people that we don't even realize until somebody says, hey, yeah, of course, you know, what do you take in your coffee? Agenda item one, please, people. Um, I believe now, though, we are more aware of gender difference. We're more aware of, you know, biological and hormonal differences. And, you know, at my age, I'm, I'm acutely conscious of what changes for us as we get older as well. So does it make a difference? Yes. Can it make a positive difference? Yes. Should all of us, no matter what we are, make the best of being us as our unique people absolutely yes do not try and be someone else just be your best you absolutely and and use it to your advantage as you said you know you what you show a level of maturity when you say i don't take it personally that i've got i'm going to make tea um and then we can get on with what we need to do this is not a big thing what we're here for is for us to move the organization forward because people often ask me what impact does it have being a black woman working in in the city and whatever and my answer is Honestly, sometimes you forget intentionally or unintentionally. And there are times when you remember, you know, but it's not something that is a huge um, every day. I'm asking myself, what is it like as a, as a black woman in the city? Blah, blah, blah. No. Um, so I love that you say, yes, um, inclusion is important. And you say being a woman has positively impacted your career. You, being a woman has potentially negatively um, uh, affected your career, but you are you, right? And you put your best foot forward in everything that you do. I absolutely love that. I want to sort of dial it back a little bit and ask you, what advice would you give to somebody who's currently temping and thinking, okay, yes, right now I heard what she said about the wallpaper, that's currently me. You know, what advice would you give to somebody thinking, how on earth can I ever advance from where I am? Because it feels like this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, number one, never leave your career in the hands of your employer. You have accountability for your career. If you want to learn something, do something, find out about something, try something, you have the power to make it happen. It may not be easy. But we have such access to opportunities now, more than ever, that you know we should no longer expect somebody else to 
which is on a training program or notice it at our mid-year review. The second thing is to recognize that you're going to try some stuff that aren't going to go, isn't going to go too well. And that's really important. It's really important that we learn to fail gracefully and with humility and have a comfort in discussing that with other people because then other people will do the same with us. And if you want a career where you're going to go far um, and you know have responsibility towards other people in your team, then creating an environment where you are honest about that is very important. So get used to it early. You know, fail at the first fence, no matter how painful it really is. And the third thing um, is to have a healthy, a healthy relationship with your own strengths. If you are one of these people, and I have been there, who routinely highlights every negative tiny word in a report or a 360 feedback or a conversation, and then is debilitated by it for a while, you know, lying on the sofa for a few hours, worrying about it, angsting about it, thinking about it, then get two highlighter pens out. Journal or on your reports. And make sure you write down the positives as well, because you are far more likely to be able to enjoy and pursue a long career when you recognize that you will be best when you build on your strengths, not when you focus solely on your weaknesses. So it's on you. And I wish everybody the absolute best with it. What phenomenal advice. Um, there's definitely notes I can take on that because I'm definitely sometimes I guilty of ruminating on all the negative things and all the bad things that I, I did, but not necessarily focusing on the strengths. And I think that's really a uh, powerful advice. But I love what you said about don't put your, your career in the hands of your employer. I've never heard it put so succinctly. <laughs> but it's so true. That's what we do. We put all our trust um, in somebody else to make it happen for us. And we just hope that as we chug along doing all the right things, ticking all the correct boxes, it will happen. Absolutely. And especially, as you say, if, if what you're doing is ticking the boxes for where you are now, then why on earth is somebody going to take responsibility, you know, to, to help you move on? I mean, ideally they will, but it's not a good working assumption. And I have to say, the phrase comes from the most unlikely source, mixed martial arts. And the phrase comes from never leave it in the hands of the judges. Because, you know, if you're into competitive sports like that, what you want is a clean result based on your own hands. What you don't want is to have judges making a decision where they may or may not see things the same way you do. So, you know, I, I credit mixed martial arts for that, but it comes from the sense of if you want to make something happen, don't leave it down to somebody else. I love that. I think that I think that's really, really powerful. The the final thing that you said, which I think is is really, really useful and something I talk about quite a lot, is this idea of failure. The F word, the dreaded F word. You know, you've talked quite a bit in, in, in our in our conversation now about how you have to fail fast, fail forward, fail head first, um, you know, and 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 all of this stuff. I mean, what is your relationship with failure? Oh, we're old friends. Um, because I've 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 spent a lot of time chatting to failure over the years. Uh, some of it's been real. A lot of it's been imagined, actually. I've got an imaginary failure friend and a real failure friend. I can't always tell which is which uh, at the time. Um, and, you know, the, the imaginary failure friend beats me up a lot more than the real failure friend, I have to say. Um, and, you know, the best advice on that is go and have conversations to find out what's real. Get people around you you can trust to give you feedback on how you're doing. And these days I've thought I've done a terrible job and others haven't and, and vice versa. So I think the thing with failure is to recognize that we all experience it. Nobody, nobody's going through life without failing. And it's why I said what I said earlier, the ability to be open about that and to talk with others. Maybe some environments make that hard, but I believe as a leader, our job is to create the right environments. When we start to open up about that, then we can help each other. When we pretend everything's okay and we've never failed and it's all fine things start to go badly wrong. You know, look at the market crash that had such a profound effect on people across the globe. Um, losing homes, companies, jobs, times wiped out. Can we honestly say that if people in that sector had had a healthier um, attitude to discussing failure and risk, that there 
we wouldn't have been better off. That's a very extreme example, but I think it makes the case. It's better to talk about little things before they become big things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, you know, keep them as friends, but give them a healthy dose of respect or disrespect when they need it. Absolutely. I absolutely love that. So we've come to the, the end of our chat. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. And I know that the people that are listening are going to find that extremely helpful. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a chat again soon. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. You're an absolute pleasure, uh, really, to, to do business with an absolute professional. Thank you. Wonderful.